Welcome to another episode of Inspire People Impact Lives. I'm your host, Josh Kosnick, Managing Partner at Northwestern Mutual. And today we have a very special guest, former Madison Police Chief Mike Corral. Chief, welcome to the show. Thanks. Really nice to have been invited. Thank you, Josh. You bet. So we're in uh, some interesting times. And before we get into all that and some of the leadership topics we want to get away, I want to read out our audience the bio because I don't think a lot of our audience, whether you've been in Madison or not, just know this bio beyond that I just found out you were Bucky for three years when you were at UW-Madison. And I gotta tell you, in my defense, that was for football, basketball, and hockey during some lean years. The only postseason I got was for a Frozen Four in Providence, Rhode Island. And by the way, back in the day, it was one, not 12. <laughs> so, you're, so, so you're a little jealous of the I am very books. jealous because sports <laughs> has definitely gotten to a high octane at Wisconsin. That's right, thanks Coach Alvarez. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, All right, so, Let's talk about, uh, real quick, the bio. 36 years of dedicated service to Madison. When I read this, I didn't realize a lot of things you had accomplished as well, just even uh, having known of you for so long, but graduated from UW-Madison with a degree in journalism, folks, and then went to receive a law degree and serve as an FBI agent for two years, and then joined the Madison Police Department in 1983. So we'll talk a little bit about the FBI. I want to ask him a couple of questions. But, uh, served as a field training supervisor, SWAT hostage negotiator, critical response team supervisor, and primary legal instructor and sergeant. As a sergeant of recruitment and training for 17 years, Chief Caval focused on diversifying the Madison Police Department in the hiring and training of officers that shared the department's progressive policing philosophy. He also taught the constitutional law portion at Madison Police Department's Academy in which he reinforced the constitutional and statutory limits on police decision making and emphasized respecting the rights of community members. He was then appointed Madison Police Department Chief in 2014, and during his tenure as Chief, he created a number of units and positions, including an MPD Mental Health Unit, an MPD Community Outreach and Resource Education Unit, MPD Violent Crimes Unit, an MPD Berkeley Burglary Crimes Unit, an MPD Detective Focused on Human Trafficking, a Use of Force Coordinator, and Neighborhood Resource Officer positions for every MPD district, all with the goal of better serving our community. And during his tenure as chief, he hired about 45% of the current MPD workforce and made 115 promotions during that time. These decisions have solidified MPD's reputation as a national leader in hiring and promoting women, of peop and, women and people of color. And during his tenure as chief, MPD has been a leader in efforts to reduce reliance on the criminal justice system and implement restorative justice initiatives. And Chief Caval retired, as many of you know, September 30th, 2019. So amazing bio. I actually want to go back to this last piece here. All right. This last piece. So we talked about, uh, you know, with all the things going on right now, um, and I think the first thing that comes to mind, I'm going to go off script right away. Oh, good. I like it. I can sweat early so, and sweat yeah. often. So <laughs> we, we, we didn't even talk about this pre-show, but we, I, what came to mind as I was reading off the mental health unit, the community outreach and resource education unit, I think, and then many more I just listed off. So with this hashtag defund the police, okay, first of all, personally, I feel that's a horrible marketing frame because when you, you know, list what they actually mean by that, mm -hmm. it seems to be they mean all of these things that you just, that you created in your tenure. Right. So, so with that messaging, and maybe, maybe it's a lack of information by us, the public, that these things actually do exist, where do you think the disconnect there is uh, between those those two messages, between what exists currently and what this movement of defund the police means, which again, for those of you that don't know, kind of look into that. Uh, again, I think it's a bad marketing name, uh, but there is some good intent behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so tell me a little bit about that. Well, let's look at that. I think that's a very good place to start because I too concur with your assessment, Josh, in that defunding the police left starkly isolated and naked on the face of the word would suggest that, oh my gosh, they're literally going to make all the cops go away. And I think that, to be fair, I think that if we get a little deeper into the weeds, the thought is, is that, well, let's look at the job dimensions currently being deployed by the cops and see where we can put civilianized subject matter experts in the position to take away some of that workload and ergo have a better sense of insight and subject matter expertise 
to get to better, more positive resolutions for the individual. And, and the best example of that is when I started the, the mental health unit. I would be the first to say we are not subject matter experts in, in mental health, although a lot of the people who became dedicated officers in that unit have psychology backgrounds, have a clinical social work backgrounds, have done a lot of that type of thing. But no, that wasn't the reason it was formed. The reason it was formed really was that we are the only 24-7 social service agency in which people who are having an episodic break usually come to the attention of others. So if someone is uh, not taking their meds or has overdosed because they're suicidal and now they're locked in a bathroom at 2 a.m. and they've paid their goodbyes and they're slashing their wrist, it's difficult to get a clinical psychologist or crisis intervention worker to go to that scene, to make that scene safe, and to then do the subsequent necessary critical follow-up that is necessary to see that this person's in a safe or better place. So what we found is that funding not being what it should or what it ought to be is that we might as well look at ourselves in the mirror and realize the cavalry isn't coming through that door. Yeah. So why don't we create positions in all of our districts with a coordinated and collaborative effort with mental health practitioners and say, how can we be more insightful, preemptive, collaborative, preventative in terms of not seeing these uh, cases as they are at their worst case scenario, but perhaps we can nip things in the bud and get these people hooked up with those mental health professionals who are more capably equipped and have the expertise to deal with it. But insofar as we haven't seen that sort of commensurate commitment in terms of that sort of response, I decided, well, we might as well do this and do this more humanely, more positively. So let's, let's have one assigned to every district. And over time, we have hired uh, three clinical, uh, through uh, our partners at Dane County Mental Health, we have embedded three clinical psychologists and caseworkers who go with our mental health officers, work with them, identify, they have full access to the same police incident reports that our people do, provide additional training to the rank and file. So if you were to tell me today as a chief of a police department that the bad news is we're going to take 20% out of your operating budget, the good news is that 20% is going directly into a civilianized mental health unit for which you guys will never have to worry about responding to mental health crises again, I'd say bring it on. <laughs> bring it on because they consume our resources and allow us not to be able to pay the kind of necessary time and effort and sensitivities that are required because it's a very drawn-out call. Yeah. So I guess, by the way, the one thing I would ask for people who are listening to this is that Defunding is in the eye of the beholder, and I would always want to know the context or, frankly, what politician is saying it and what is their end game here. Right. Because some of the buzzwords that have become now the functional equivalent of defunding has been reimagining, and I'm putting that in, in quotations. If reimagining is less off-putting, so be it. But if we're going to take those resources away from the cops, then by default, we need to see who's picking up the slack so that we're just not playing word games with it, but the problems at its core still remains and aren't being addressed. Right. What's the intent and how well has it been thought through exactly. to make sure that unintended consequences are, are really thought through? And that's exactly right. And I don't think anybody would argue for looking at how we police from a systems improvement model. Uh, that's one of our core values, as a matter of fact. And if, in fact, you can say that we think that this civilianized crisis unit staffed solely and exclusively by social workers is the better way to get at root causes and to provide better outcomes, hey, we're all for it. Encore, encore. Where do we sign up? We'll be very affirming. If all we have to do is get into the scene, make that scene stay safe, 
and then bring in the subject matter experts uh, who are civilianized and have the time, the resources, and the referrals, and the diagnostics to do it right, by all means, we'll be happy to step away and get on to the other pressing calls for service. Yeah, well, that's really good. One, one of the things I think, again, an outsider looking in, that I think politicians are particularly bad at, and yeah. I mean, we can all sit here and criticize politicians, I think, all day, but my, my, my particular critique is not really addressing unintended consequences. Usually a Band-Aid fix or an immediate fix due to social pressures right. and not thinking about what the unintended, unintended consequences are gonna be, whether it's a month from now, a year from now, or 10 years from now. Because they may be out of office by then and they don't care what the rest of us do. Absolutely. Uh, Josh, you've just uh, you know, literally been spot on in your analysis. My concern is that we don't sense the sort of long-term longitudinal, thoughtful, intentional idea of looking at this in terms of those unintended consequences. There is a tendency to reach for the lowest hanging fruit. How does it sound and how does it look optically with the current political campaigns or cycles? And that's where I think we were bordering on unconscionable uh, sort of understandings of really doing creative problem solving well. And what could us as the public then do to help kind of fix that problem? Because like, we're part of the problem in demanding solutions right? And that optically sound or feel good, but may not, again, address the unintended consequences that could happen from those looking and feeling good solutions. I think one of the things is that as informed consumers of our services, we have to acknowledge that the short-sighted sort of news uh, bites or sound bites or even what people may get from whatever our con conventional or traditional journalistic services really don't do the deep dives and that's going to require a little more sweat equity on the part of the consumer of those services. I would be the first to say that let's take a look at the job dimensions of a police officer nowadays. While we use the term, and, and this is a sort of a semantics thing with me, but I've been very intentional throughout my career. I have no problem in and of itself with the term, I'm a law enforcement officer, except to the extent that when talking about Madison in particular, I've never used that term. I always say, we are committed to policing the community with the community. And the only nuance or context for that is, if we look at the job dimensions, law enforcement, enforcement of laws, is perhaps only 25% of the given workload. Mm -hmm. The rest of the stuff is literally being a service provider, being a social work, doing first-time diagnostics on people who are in mental crisis, people who are in addiction, uh, facilitating the movement of traffic, uh, mediating civil disputes, landlord-tenant. There is so much in our work portfolio that is service driven that I think policing is a fairer representation in a word than to confine it to the terms of law enforcement exclusively. Nothing that that's wrong in and of itself, but I think if we can look at what it is a police officer does, and I always say when I was recruiting, we are social workers slash service providers with statutory authorities that are, t are very atypical because there's a use of force and an arrest component. But be that as it may, we're unapologetic for the fact that on any given day, I'm a mental health worker, I'm providing naloxone to someone who's OD'd on heroin, I am facilitating a crash site so that the injured are helped and traffic can, can continue to free flow, I am a de facto mentor to kids that uh, lack any kind of role model or, or, or need some understanding listening ear. So there are so many proverbial hats that are worn that I don't want us to be painted into the corner uh, as this exclusivity of law enforcement. It is a part of what we do, sure. inescapably so, and, and unapologetically, that's part of the oath of office in our constitutions, we're to uphold the law, but also to protect the rights. Yeah, so like getting into that, and I think also then, taking that a step further, is some laws don't necessarily benefit all people. Correct. Correct. So in, in terms to, of their look, yes, you're yeah, absolutely correct. Right. So then if you're just in law enforcement and that's what your messaging is, that can be a mis, mis messaging like we talked about defund the police. Absolutely. Then, that, then, okay, well, 
if some laws aren't fair to me, then do I start questioning all laws? Yeah, that's one of those things. And you know, people always say, you know, uh, we're looking at the concern of the police are part of systemic racism. What do you say about that, Chief Kobel? I said, well, I, I think as part of that algorithm, absolutely we're complicit in institutional racism, uh, as are several institutions besides just being the gatekeepers to the criminal justice system. So often is the case is that when the police are ultimately called to a scene, it is the last desperate act of desperate people who have been failed in a number of contexts, mm -hmm. whether it's joblessness, whether it's through the throes of addiction and, or mental health. And, and now we're seeing the outward manifestations. Someone has called 911 and it's sort of like, we're the psh, clean up aisle six. There's been a floor spill and, and we're, we're dealing with what we see, but we have no understanding of what led to that action or whatever. That's why uh, I think that when, 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 when we're talking about institutional change and stuff, the cops were complicit when we look at Jim Crow laws. Now those were laws on the books and the heavies that were, had a very prominent role in, in making sure that the black and white segregationist Jim Crow laws were enforced were the cops. So we, we have dirty hands in coming to this. Mm -hmm. It is a part of our history that we have to own and acknowledge. However, similarly, I think the cops uh, can also point and say, we are looking at the symptoms of why we're going to calls and understanding, is this something that can be redirected, deflected? Is it more appropriate in a mental health capacity? Is it more appropriate in looking at underlying addiction issues? Is it more important in looking at this as a, as a juvenile who's basically a virgin in a lot of cases to the criminal justice system? Could we look at that as an option? Is there a, 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 could there be more mentoring done? But at the end of the day, we also have an obligation to those who are victims of crimes. And if we've done all we can in terms of looking at the diagnostics of what's prompting the behavior, some people are chronic offenders and they're creating legions of new victims. And those are the people specifically where we have to say we have a duty and a responsibility and the constitutional powers to enforce those laws, which aren't in fact having an unintended consequence, but do create a deleterious impact in creating victims. Well, what I love about your, what you said a little bit earlier in yeah. that was uh, something that's been beat into my head through equity and inclusion training mm -hmm. is it's not, let's say you and I as white men, it's, it's not our fault and we are responsible. Yeah. Right? Well, so we we're have, responsible to continue forward. Oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I agree with you. And, I, and I'm so glad to hear that, you know, we've been trying to do as an institution, as is your company, I'm sure as an institution, is to bring a better awareness of the sort of um, implicit biases we have. Um, in some instances, the, the privileges that I've enjoyed as a white male, I, I can't walk a mile in terms of the life experience of others who have not been so blessed as I have in having, for example, two parents, I've never had to miss a meal, I've never had, a, for want of having enough mentors in either sports or or school and academics that are willing to coach me up or get me to the point where I want to go. Uh, my parents have never been unemployed, I've never been displaced, and I don't have parents who were uh, inclined to addiction. So I have many of God's blessings that uh, I'm grateful for, and I don't use that as a calling card, but I also say that I have to be more sensitive and more understanding and a more proactive listener to those who haven't had those advantages that I've had and understand that to walk a mile in someone else's shoes is the newest challenge that I have to continue to ask myself in terms of being open-mindedness to whatever obstacles and impediments that other people have had to face. Yeah, that's really good. What do you think is the uh, number one thing the police could do better in such high tensions right now? Boy, I think the problem is, is that if we could, I'd love to get like a New York 
uh, advertising and marketing company to sort of literally blitzkrieg the airwaves and, and all the print media and everything that's digitalized to sort of look at the, the grand sum of our work effort in its entirety as opposed to the selective, most salacious, most disturbing, and most uh, disquieting stuff that is captured on film. Now, we have to own the fact, and you probably can appreciate this as a, a corporate manager, is that I'm prepared to say that in any institution or walk of life, whether it's lawyers, whether it's doctors, whether it's nursing, whether it's corporations, whether it's dentists, you name it, I'm saying that there's basically a 95-5 rule in the sense that 95% of whatever niche or demographic you care to address, people are meeting and exceeding society's expectations for reasonable behavior and good conduct and a, and a healthy moral compass. But in my line of work, when your five percenters, or probably significantly less, are not embracing our values, are not doing as they're trained to do, have somehow slipped through the cracks or haven't been disciplined, haven't been discharged, or should never have been hired. For those sort of who uh, sort of skirt the moral compass of what the culture that you're trying to create in your workplace is, is designed to do, and when they get on camera, uh, and, and it's offensive for me to see the same stuff because they are tainting the badge, they're tainting the profession, and they are creating greater gaps of mistrust for the police and what the police do. So let's just take one, if, if I had to focus on one thing, one thing at all, I would say uh, when I first became chief, I said, let's quantify those instances where our officers are using force as part of the outcome. And by that I mean they push somebody, they, they, they trip somebody, they tase somebody, they pepper spray, whatever the case is, let's compile that on a quarterly basis and then let's put it on our website and then let's show the circumstances of the call, the age, race and gender of the victim and the age, race, gender and number of years of experience of the officer. And let's do this not in a sort of a shotgun blast, let's do it every quarter. Hmm. And so what we found from doing that is that roughly there are 15,000 to 18,000 calls, depending on seasonal stuff, uh, a month where there's a cop to constituent face-to-face. -face. Okay, oh, and, and an interaction. Just in Madison. Yeah, just in Madison. So every quarter, you're starting probably from forty-five to 48,000 interactions a quarter between cop and community member. When you quantify all of that, and I've been putting it, we had been putting it on, I keep saying we, uh, when I was the chief and they still have maintained that, I'd say let's put it on the website. One thing that I believe every constituent deserves and ought to expect is transparency and accountability from its police force. Mm -hmm. And so in that spirit, let's publish it and, and take questions. And so what you would find since I've been doing that, and we've been doing that for over five and a half years now, is that never in any quarter report, never was there more than 0 .050 of 1% where the cops literally used force and went uh, hands-on with someone to the point where there was a confrontation. And yet, fast forward to your question, which I haven't forgotten, right. is that I'm concerned that increasingly the narrative on police is being defined solely or exclusively through the lens of use of force. And, and I think that's a, a, a misplaced paradigm of thinking about the police function in today's modern era society. Now, are there police departments that perhaps uh, are still engaged in profiling and or other deleterious effects that have a clearly consequential impact on people of color? Well, of course we have to examine all that bag of ills because 
we're, we're a part of the process. We have an obligation to continually look in the mirror and say, what are we doing intentionally? But also, let's listen to the community. What are we doing unintentionally that's creating these the bad yeah. numbers? Yeah. And so I think we have that obligation. I'm not washing my hands sort of as Pasha's pilot saying, that's not a me problem, that's a you problem. We're, we know what we're doing here. Absolutely, you can't be that tone deaf to what the community is saying. But similarly, we have not done a good job of, over time, explaining to the community the totality of what the officer has been trained to do, the kinds of calls we go on, and that this literally is less than a 1% fraction of who we are. And, and I guarantee you, the officers today, as they have been under my regime, you're trained to de-escalate, create space, wait for backup, um, look for a, a, a comfortable boundary so that you can do everything in your power to avoid use of lethal force. And yet sometimes it's, it's unavoidable and or the circumstances are so dynamic that it just happens too quickly in all of those training mechanisms. But there's always, always, always uh, efforts, at least in the Madison Police Department, to look at diffusing and de-escalating as our first best options to avoiding even going hands-on. Now, the best we've been able to accomplish from time to time is that we've invited community leaders, either those by title or de facto leaders who we see recurringly in the media or coming to things, and we say, why don't you attend one of our community academies and learn and see exactly what the training is for eight weeks, two hours a night, every Wednesday, and see what that's like. Or we'll ask media members. But quite frankly, while that's been a good faith attempt, it's sort of hit and miss in terms of how that opportunity to have a, a deeper dive really resonates and then matriculates over to a, a greater sort of Johnny Appleseed. And there's other people that say, hey, wait a minute, I had an epiphany when I went to this academy. So I think we need to have some almost something like uh, public service in which, and one of the things I would do is I'd go to the high schools and we'd do brochures and I'd say, here are your constitutional rights. This is what the cops can do and this is what your rights are in contrast to those questions. So when I taught constitutional law for, as a sergeant, 18 years, and then as the chief, because I wanted to have that value really imprinted early on from the recruit class. When I taught con law, I would always start with a rights perspective. My professor in law school was the Minnesota State Public Defender. Hmm. And so we always started from, here are the citizens' rights. And we'd go through them exhaustively, comprehensively. And then only after we exhausted those rights, then we would talk about, here are police powers. But I always talked about police limitations in advance of police powers, mindful of constituent rights. That, I think, is something that we have to do more emphasis nationally because I think the norm nationally is, here are your powers, yeah. your powers of arrest, the search, to seize, uh, and, and so forth. And so for me, I start with the rights, limitations, and then I get to the police powers clause because I ultimately say to my recruits, you know, you're a cop eight hours a day. Imagine if you're a constituent. Don't, you're only a cop eight hours. Don't you want 24 hours of freedom, of knowing that you're not going to be hassled or stopped or contacted by the cops? Uh, isn't that important to you? Well, of course it is, chief or sergeant, whatever my role is at the time. Well, then let's put ourselves in those sets of understandings and those mindsets and say, why do you think then that people are resentful if you're coming to contact them? I don't know what their life experience has been in Milwaukee or Chicago or even in Madison. If they've had some bad life experiences with the cops, it's up to us to sort of clean the slate and say, these are your rights, and, yeah. and you don't have to do this. like you to do this, but these are what we can do. This is what we can't do. And I, I don't know how we can sort of galvanize this understanding of public service 
uh, uh, education, unless you're starting maybe in, in the high schools, as I would have liked to see more done in terms of teaching. Not that I wanted to be a propaganda agent for the cops. I wanted to be, I, I went to a memorial for 20 years. First as the, as the, as a sergeant, and then as the chief. And I said, okay, there's no public information officer here. There's no spin zone. You bring up whatever stories you have personally or hypothetically happened to a friend, and let's just go from there, and let's talk about what we can do, the cops, what we can't do, and whether your experience could be reconciled within that. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to act as an apologist. Do, is every one of my cops fabulous, courteous, kind, polite, you know, the mantra of all that is good? Nope. Nope, and that's on me, because from a quality control and assurance standpoint, you deserve to be treated with dignity, respect, informed, and to the extent that we haven't done that, then shame on us. That's not the kind of customer focus that we want to leave with you as a consumer of our services. But also, let's also think what the frame of mind might be from the cop's perspective, not that I'm apologizing for it or defending it or deflecting it, but just so you have an idea of what they might be thinking when they approach a car uh, after dark in a park two hours after it's been closed and there are four people in there and, you're, and you have one and you're wondering, what am I coming upon? Is this a minor curfew, the rites of passage of a high school student? Is this uh, more uh, of some sort of a planning for something? If so, if what? Is it just underage drinking? In any event, I have a duty to investigate and I'd like to be able to see what's your explanation of conduct in a respectful way. And I love that you owned, as a leader, that the buck stops with you. Right oh, it has to. It, it, we have to own that. And, and for all the good uh, and marvelous uh, things that come to my office, uh, I, you always, maybe it's like, it's, it's like if you're Lou Saban or if you're Barry Alvarez, if you're any one of these wonderful Division I college coaches, you actually probably, and it's, it's not healthy, but you probably remember your losses more than the big wins because you want to make everything a win. And for me, while I love, and you do, you get inundated with positive comments from the community, the ones that give me pause here, why did we mess up in this instance? What could have been done better? Why, what in the world was the officer thinking? Or why didn't the, the officer's backup intentionally and affirmatively intervene seeing that this call was going south and just get a new face and a new voice and take the call. One of the things I did as a chief is that I put into our policy manual you have as a Madison police officer an affirmative duty to intervene when you see misconduct or excessive use of force and if you don't at least report it to a supervisor or or literally infuse yourself as a stopgate, making this call go bad or go south, then you too are also going to be an accomplice to the misconduct and you are held culpable for your failure to take timely action. You have at minimum a duty to step in, stop it, and call a supervisor. If you're not gonna stop it altogether, you have a duty to report, you have a duty to intervene, and if we find out that you had opportunities to do both and chose to keep your hands in your pocket, that's a problem for us because that's a problem for the culture of policing. That's, you know, we can all reflect on, of course, the horrific events of Minneapolis. And the primary or the principal officer, his uh, deliberate indifference to the needs of someone who had a medical emergency, if nothing else, and the placement of his knee or whatever, that's not really consistent with our training, but I've heard disputed things from the Minneapolis authorities that that was part of there. Be that as it may, his deliberate indifference to the needs of someone in a medical emergency uh, was abhorrent to watch for any of us. Mm -hmm. If you're the chief of police, though, like me, I'm just as disturbed by what were the other three officers doing? They were, there may have been some attempts. I think I heard on one body cam, someone said, maybe we should let him sit up if he can't breathe while he's lying down. 
But to me, that goes to a deeper root problem that I see just as a snapshot. I don't know anything about it, but what is the culture of the Minneapolis Police Department such that three people Didn't. would just witness yeah. it and not take affirmative action to alter the trajectory of where the call was going. And that, that concerns me from a culture standpoint that I didn't see a greater recognition of that. So I love that you, you set those principles for the Madison Police Force. I wish we could have that uh, all around. One of the principles that I have in our office for our leadership team is we are all the sheriff. So it very resembles you because I can't be in every situation. Right. Uh, we gotta make sure that, that everyone feels empowered to say something if something if they see something that's wrong. And that's what you did with Madison. You know what's interesting about that George Floyd story that you just shared and, and seeing how poorly that went. I saw a video, I wanna say within a month after that, where two police officers were bringing a, a suspect to the ground and someone had their knee on the neck, one of them, and the other one pushed it push, back. Pushed it back, or yeah. pulled it back. I yep. uh, can't remember the specific circumstances, but I have a vivid memory of that. Yep. There's two officers. One, you know, whether the training was that way or not, but had his knee on the neck. This was very shortly after the George Floyd killing. I remember seeing it as well. And pulling it back or pushing it back. So and then you said there's three officers in the Minneapolis case that did none of, didn't even attempt it. Yeah, and I think there was some uh, dicta that you could hear in the background where from the body camera footage, uh, there was some at least, you could see some angst and anxiety by the other three. But at the end of the day, you know, expressing sort of your you know, disapproval doesn't hack it. You got to do something more affirmative, more intentional in order to right the wrong or to make this call. Every call has a trajectory. What can I do to make it for the, I always call it PBR, PBR, and, and the recruits are sick of it and the, and the old people are probably so tired of it that they'll, they'll go to the grave with it. I said, we're not talking about beer. No, we're not talking about beer. <laughs> yes, that's true. I said, what in every instance is the best possible resolution? And in some instances, when you weigh all of the factors and the resources and the circumstances of the case, the totality of the case is sometimes, uh, like in domestic violence, where there is no discretion that there's probable cause to affect an arrest, sometimes PBR means you have to arrest someone. But in instances like, uh, as we've said, a mental health issue, is arrest really the right idea for someone who's having an episodic break, or should we be looking at a civil commitment detention order? Is that, even though that's gonna take you eight hours to do it by the books, and it's much more tempting to just throw someone in the jail with a disorderly conduct charge, it'll take 45 minutes tops, don't be tempted by that sort of tainted fruit, because if we're being good moral officers as officers of the court, and looking at PBR, best possible resolution, we should be looking at what's the best. Yeah. I want to ask you about how you discipline, but before I want to before I do that, I don't want to forget this story, because I've had experiences with some of your officers, uh, or former officers, that uh, still do this to this day. But they partnered with uh, Dr. Nestor Rodriguez at Carbon World Health, and uh, it's been about every Monday that a few of your officers will come in with at-risk kids. Um, I would say probably sixth to eighth grade, I think, mm -hmm. is the target there, and they're working out with them. That's perfect. And, and just getting to know them and uh, being there for them. I think sometimes in, in some cases they're even giving them rides home. Um, so they're taking time out of their uh, civil life, yeah. let's say, to, uh, to have that influence and create those relationships, kind of uh, build that bridge with some of our at-risk at youth. So I think in your uh, story in the, uh, that you were talking about in the past there, I didn't want to lose that point because there is some of that going on. I think that yeah. as you were saying, there just needs to be more community bridge. I, I love the fact you brought that up because my concern is that, and we we'll go back to your sort of defunding, if, if the cops are asked to do more with fewer resources, I don't want to see the police solely or exclusively as a call and response mechanism of the government. Because if all we're dealing with is crisis, calamity, chaos in a reactive mode, Typically, that thrusts us as a sort of um, almost an occupying army that's there uh, to provide sanctions. If all you are being called to is the hammer for a nail, it's very easy to see why mistrust builds. I would tell my officers back in the day, in 
they'll get sick of it, probably vomiting in their mouths just thinking about it. But we had posters everywhere. And it's a pinwheel. And the pinwheel is engage, relate, listen, explain, repeat. Engage, relate, listen, explain, repeat. So if I had an officer who actually had some downtime between calls, if they drive by a neighborhood a basketball standard and sees a kid shooting hoops, park the car, get out, engage, shoot some hoops, walk through a mall, be, let people see you in a proactive engaging modality when there isn't crisis underfoot, chaos and calamity. Let them see that quote soft side of You're policing. A human too. Yeah. Be relatable in that sense. And and so many of the officers would like to do more of it if they weren't right now being thrust in a the, the quandary of going call to call to call to call to right. call with just nine one one things. And if you're gonna continue to constrict resources then there will be more of just the call and the response. And then you get the self-fulfilling prophecy of a predicted police department that looks nothing more than a, an occupying army, which is certainly not beneficial to building that kind of community trust. So you say self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that's the same as unintended consequences. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, and, and, and again, we got to be careful what we wish for and ask absolutely. for as, as a community. You are so uh, right. So those those one percent or less than one percent of calls that go bad, mm-hmm. uh, or maybe where there's a use of force. Use of force. Now let's say you find out someone acted outside of their means. They did something wrong, uh, whether it was a tragic something wrong or minor something wrong. What was in your leadership style your way of discipline? Well, a lot of it is statutory, but also is is that when you're working for me. Um, I understand having walked a mile in those shoes that there are instances when you are being asked to make decisions in a nanosecond and that sometimes the use of your resources being what it is at 2 in the morning, you're trying to do the best you can with what available resources or backups that you have. But if you are literally deciding to be lazy or taking shortcuts or not a following policy or procedure, I'm going to be the first that you're going to see because I have, as the chief, I have a responsibility to show that the police are policing themselves to some extent. Now, there's a whole way, you know, people talk about, oh, the police aren't accountable. Well, let's look at that. First of all, the chief has internal affairs or professional discipline. And we have a, a kind of an interesting culture in Madison in that the majority of our complaints don't come from the community about an officer. A lot of our complaints, the majority of them I was there, are coming from coworkers who mm-hmm. saw something, witnessed it, and said, oh, whoa, this, is, this isn't cool. This is now we're supposed to police. So we would have a lot of self-reported things by our officers as well as constituents. So we fully investigate the officer, and if there are sanctions that are appropriate, they get sanctioned. If a community member doesn't, think, well, I can't trust the police to police themselves, then they can go to a public library or go online and do their own complaint, and it'll go directly to the PFC, and the PFC can listen to that complaint. The other things that you know that hold the police responsible, obviously the fourth estate, media, if cops act out, you're going to be plastered on the front page, you're going to go viral on social media platform. You can be before sued. the facts are heard. Absolutely, you can be sued civilly. Uh, we saw actually, obviously, in the tragic circumstances of the Louisville case of Brianna Taylor, uh, that wrongful death action by the city of Louisville was a twelve million dollar hit. Hey, real quick on that. Yeah, obviously, I don't want to get into too much of that case because there's right. a lot of opinions there. But oh yeah. Uh, Specifically, as it relates to that twelve to fifteen million, I think is the range that they they settle. Who pays for that? Well, in this case, the the city is are usually self insured, but working with an underwriter. There's an insurance. In, in our an case, insurance. there's so like an insurance. In our, in our world, we have errors and omissions. In the in the medical world, they have malpractice. Yep. So is this fully covered by insurance, or is this somewhat on the taxpayers? Well, it'll ultimately be on the taxpayers as well because that. Obviously, when you file a claim, it's going to have to be somebody is, that collected means is going to have to be adopted by somehow, in some way, in order for them to move forward. Yeah. So, yes, I would definitely say that 
ultimately there will be a trickle down effect. But in the in the short analysis, the city through its underwriting will definitely be paying a hefty bill. But what you'll find is that the next year, the city will have to Induce their rates will go up because of that huge advice. settlement, which is why there's that trickle down effect. At least there's insurance. That makes me feel a little bit better as yes. a taxpayer because the, the cost of the insurance is going to be far less than the twelve to fifteen million dollar payout. Yes. Even with the increase that'll go up. Although, and I know I'm talking to a guy at Northwestern Mutual, so <laughs> okay. I, I, to be perfectly fair, sometimes what I have found is that in the world of policing, decisions that the cops and the chief would like to see go to court and have our day in court and be fully litigated and transparent and all the evidence come to light, sometimes a business model will corrupt that desire. Mm -hmm. And I, corrupt is too hard. Sometimes the business model is, yeah, yeah, we know you want your day in court, but our insurance, our attorneys tell us it's simpler because of the expensive nature of litigation to cut a check so, for 50 grand and settle rather than have your day in court. No, I understand. And that, that frustrates yeah. cops. Yeah, I'm sure it does, but uh, But it's it's a business model. Well, there's there's instances that I can't speak to of course from mutual, but but that they'll get sued or an agent will sure. get sued um, and advise same way that it's cheaper to settle yep. even with, and where that frustration comes in is if if you're in the right. Right. But it's more expensive to go to court to prove your right. Exactly, and that's where we're at. But, you know, that's you know, so that's that, that's the hard thing. I get that. So a really hot button I don't want to miss is the qualified immunity. Yeah. And ending that. Um, I don't know exactly you know the best question to ask, so I'll just throw it out there. How your feeling on that? How it's perceived in the community versus? Uh, I mean, oh, maybe I'll just say, it. should qualified immunity for cops be ended? I don't think so because I think what we're at right now is is in a cycle whereby our recruitment is dropped by almost 50% and our retention is scary in terms of the exodus that's leaving. And for me to have yet one more sense that you're going to come on here doing a very difficult job where a lot of times there's two strikes against you before you ever get out of the batter's box. And now the fact that you might be personally held liable for your acts if it looks like you strayed beyond the scope of your training and employment might really be a cold, uh, chilly blanket to be able to throw on trying to get qualitative people uh, to, to, to enlist in this proposition. I mean, I still think that as long as it's shown, I always tell officers, if you're doing as you're trained, doing what's in the scope of your employment, the city is ultimately going to have the deep pockets. The city is the one that's ultimately going to have to pay if mistakes in judgment were ultimately made and bad results occur. But I said, if, just so you know, if you literally leave mother's milk and decide you're going to do this because it's you and you're to hell with the training and you know it violates our policy and our procedures if you're out there then you're on an island yeah. and we're yeah. going to separate from you at our earliest beckoning call and then that's on you you're going to be personally liable so i don't know to what extent that conversation needs to get pushed in terms of i think one of the things i'd like to see is that uh, and, and again i'm a former member of the Madison Professional Police Officers Association. So I'm a former board steward. And now I'm also a recovering chief. I've done both <laughs> jobs. And I can tell you that uh, because there are fundamental fairness issues in due process, which I support, to some extent, I, I feel bad that the unions are compelled by virtue of their dues paying members to shelter people that really shouldn't be in the profession. Yeah, how do we fix that though? That, that's the one thing that I would like to see. I'd like to re-examine that paradigm to say unions, you can still bargain for salary, work conditions, and benefits, but perhaps in a separate uh, line, if you will, in a separate vein, officers uh, in cooperation with their city should look at buying their own personal liability insurance. So you're not put in this position, if you will, to, to have to people. protect bad acts. Yeah. 
the bad acts, I think even the union you know, sort of bites it and says, well, you know, this is part of our charter. And, and un, unwittingly, that works against the unions in terms of the optics, is that you're sheltering bad behaving cops. And, and it gets and, magnified. Like and it gets said. amplified. Yeah, and I, I think those are the things. I think between the, the personal liability versus the, the reconstituted role of unions, I think those things both have to be tweaked and looked at. One thing I don't want to miss as we're running up on time sure. is you've done, you did a lot of work in your time uh, with creating more diversity and inclusion efforts. Yeah. What do you think was so, why, why were you driven by that? I know what started before you, but it was part of the force and you created some separate things that uh, advanced it. Why was that so important for you and for our community? Well, let's look at the composition roughly of Madison. Um, I, at the time that I first started recruiting, over 25 years ago, I said, how am I going to build community trust if every cop that is seen in every local context or engagement is a white guy with a bad haircut like me? And a mustache. And it, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you exactly. Mustache. I'm still waiting for that blessed event, but no, no. A little baked peach fuzz now. And then. <laughs> but, you know, I said, no, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you you have to use the proper bait when you go fishing. And quite frankly, I think you get more public buy-in if more people that look like them are reflected in those engagement, those encounters, those calls. And, and so to that extent, what it, it's still a major source of chagrin for me that if you look at federal, state, county, municipal, corrections and university all those have cops women represent 12 percent of the workforce wow 12 percent, and, and we're talking 2020 right now and when i said guys that i've seen at carbon sure, yeah. i actually meant there are some of, oh yes well, so. and i take it generically yeah, like officers, that yeah. and that's why i just say that's that not, no offense taken uh and so madison when i left now they've dropped a little bit when i left we were at 30 percent, and i was being asked will you fly here will you fly there will you fly what are you doing? I'm like, what, what I'm doing is that I'm talking to people about what the real dimensions are of policing, social work and service, and you don't have to be a former Irish offensive tackle for Notre Dame with a criminal justice major to do this job. You have to have relatability, you have to have communication skills, you have to be aspirational, you have to be well working as a member of a team. All of those attributes, if you will, uh, creates an environment for a culture that says we can do more with what we're what 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 we've been typecast as. Let's move away. And and frankly, we're our own worst enemies. When you know everybody wants to watch movies about police action, Jackson and SWAT and tactical stuff, and we buy into that. And you know. We were complicit in that. I said, you know, we're our own worst enemy. We've created that stereotype. And now we have to be empowered to change the narrative. And that's by getting women, people of color, the LGBTQ recognition, and getting all of those folks as providers. And so what did you do specifically as you went and recruited? Because there's one thing to recruit. Right. It was a totally different thing to make sure that it is equitable yep. and uh, inclusive. Sure. Right? And so that's the thing that a lot of people miss and, and where a lot of uh, people in the people of color community, if that was redundant, sorry, uh, and then women and LGBTQ are talking about, okay, you're just trying to hit a quota, but what are you trying to do to make sure that I feel comfortable? So yeah. how did you guys Once you come on, that? exactly. That's the thing. Because at the end of the day, if you're you know just a poser, and you're just posturing, uh, you're inauthentic, and right. people will get that the minute they get to your academy. So you for have to create a culture. Like Absolutely, you have to create that culture. So for us, what we, a lot of things we've done is, first of all, the short analysis might be is that if all I wanted was criminal justice majors, why wouldn't I just send somebody down to Platteville? They have a great program. But I don't want just CJ majors. I want anthro, I want business, I want psych, I want social work. I want, we have, like I said, I'm a 12 step recovering journalism major. Pray for me. <laughs> Pray for me, especially when you see today. But so I too can make myself something of myself. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter the degree, but when you got your degree, can you demonstrate 
critical thinking? Can you speak? Can you write? Can you empathize about root causes of what creates behaviors? Uh, can you suspend judgments of others? Are, are, do you understand the fact that we're unapologetically social workers? Because if you're John or Joan Wayne, we don't want you. And so you have to widen your cone and you have to send people like African-American women, uh, Latinas. You have to send people like that back to these schools or to say, I've been told by my chief or by my case when I was a sergeant is that you can ask me anything. And if you go to our website today on our recruiting page, we have literally the rainbow picture of cops of every diverse nature and demographic known. And you as a potential recruit can have a silent chat with any of them and none of that conversations gets translated up or into the recruiting of you. They, if I, I don't know what it's like to be a black male cop in Madison, but I got someone on that recruiting board that'll tell you exactly the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because I, I don't want to be looked at as a bait and switch recruiter. Or a know-it-all. Or a know-it-all. I, I, I want to say, you know, I can't relate to what it's like to be transgender. But I have people in my department who are, and let them talk to you about what challenges they have faced and continue to face within the confines of the MPD, a very imperfect and flawed group of individuals who have a good heart, but sometimes aren't fast enough to galvanize those changes and those necessities that others recognize because we're not a part of that group. Yeah, well, that's really good. That is really good. So I know we're running up on time, Chad, sure. but I want to uh, get in the word game. I okay, also, so I'm uh, gonna be a, I, is my wife will say I'm terrible at games, but I will try to hold up my end. Well, I think your 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 biggest issue is you're gonna to have to keep it to one word. Or two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick, 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 quick. So I was a ne hostage negotiator for 12 years, and we had uh, a jailer uh, who was taken hostage by three inmates up at the old Dane County Jail back in '89, I want to say. In any event, afterwards, so they called me to negotiate uh, the release of this individual, and I had a partner, but I was the primary talker. And afterwards, you know, we, we got the deputy freed and all three guys surrendered without additional incidents. So I'm looking for a critique of my performance. So I asked the, the SWAT commander for the county, I said, so how do I do? I'm feeling pretty good. He says, well, Officer Cobalt then, uh, you did well and got a good outcome. Some constructive feedback is, is that um, if you had let them get a word in edgewise, it might not have taken 12 hours to spread. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the truth. It's the truth. you got to listen. Was that, that was early on in your career? Yeah, very early. So like, that's the thing is, um, as I'm training new advisors as well, is my dad told me at a very young age, because we're very much alike and both bullheaded type A males, <laughs> he goes, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. I love <laughs> it. It's sage. He's right. It's and true. Then, and it's true. So the young advisors, look, look no. Our job is to listen. Absolutely. Uh, you ask a question and shut up. Absolutely. And let them talk. And Absolutely. sometimes, if they don't speak, you know, immediately, it's because they're thinking, not because mm -hmm. they don't have anything to say. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting. My so wife to this day says, "It's okay for you to take a breath if they want to ask a question. It's okay to have it." See, I always got intimidated by the pregnant pause, like, oh, maybe I should fill that gap. Many in. people so, are uncomfortable with that. They are. Uh, so some uh, just sage advice for the audience. Here You're is right. Like, count to three. Count to ten. Make it a game yeah. to see who talks first. If you talk first, you lose. So that's some of the things that we'll talk about with our new advisors because you're, you're trying to show uh, professionals and you're trying to show that you know what you're talking about. Sure. You're trying to keep them engaged, but you're actually detracting from what they have to say or think or making it less important by very wise so very much. wise I, that's my takeaway from our conversation so now we know that the word game could take 20 minutes yeah so yeah, yeah it could be i'm gonna have All a lot right. of pregnant pauses here go <laughs> we'll ahead try it out. first word love um of god passion passion uh, i would say doing things 110 percent Duty. Faith. Chad family. Through. Country. Chad threw this in here. West High School. 
Reggie Regent. <laughs> That's how I got my start. I was the mascot. That's how you got to be Bucky. You yeah, so I had some experience. And actually, truth be told, I was offered a tryout with my team, our team, the Chicago Bears. But I, at that point in my life, with law school, said, no, I can't do it. <laughs> Did you get any shit for this? Oh yeah. my gosh, constantly got nothing but crap for God's sake. I would imagine. Oh. I have a fellow managing partner that was chief alumni oh, yeah. for University of Illinois. He's, oh, yeah. out, uh, he's out east now. Oh yeah. Uh, but, um, and obviously that mascot's under yes. uh, further review, but uh, he, you know, that, was a, that was a big deal. You weren't putting on a mask. You no. Know, so that's different. But all right, let's get back into the game. Got it. Family. Oh. Irish Catholic. Life. First word. My first word. Opportunities. Death. No regrets. Service. Job one. My two favorite. Inspire or inspiration? What comes to mind when you think of those? Inspire. Uh, Father Ted Hesburgh from longtime rector of the University of Notre Dame, fabulous priest, uh, diplomat, um, civil rights activist. Uh, those are the kinds of inspirational images I still have. And I'll let you explain him because he, uh, I, I didn't know who that was either. So oh, yeah. Sure well, know. right now, if you want to get to this great autobiography, God, Country, Notre Dame, uh, it's his uh, autobiography. I'm, I'm a big Notre Dame faithful follower, and uh, it really shows sort of the the multi talented um, talents required of a moral compassed, positive, supportive, nurturing, inclusive leader in a time when nowadays those are few and far between to find that haven't been adulterated, and I think that that would be something that a lot of people could. Appreciate it. I'll check it out. I told you where my wife was from, so she's a Notre Dame fan as well. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Go Anderson. Actually, you know, it was interesting, real quick before we get into the last word. When you brought up the example of Notre Dame to be a cop, I was like, as a financial advisor, that math doesn't work. <laughs> no, as, as my son will tell you, who's still looking at 80 grand from their law school. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that math doesn't work. Out no, so much, no, advisor. not so much. <laughs> so, all right, impact. Impact. Uh, it goes back to each in us and our own personal duty. Well, good job on the word game. So look, for the last two questions, how, uh, or I should say, uh, favorite book of all time or newest one you read that you want to shout out? I know you just shouted one out. But, uh, yeah, that's the one I'd shout out because that's the one that I'm, I'm actually rereading for the second time. So that's a really good So read. say it again with title. It, it's, it's, I literally, God, Country, and Notre Dame by Father Theodore Hesburgh, Ted, Father okay. Ted. And uh, it certainly shows his evolution as a priest, as a man, as a leader. And I think that some of those um, axioms that he represents are still erstwhile and teachable to us in this modern era of conflict. Well, that's good. So last question, I uh, told you I'd uh, tell you, ask you about this, but how can our audience follow you, get in touch with you, or... Uh, you know, just because I think that in this uh, unrest time, I think it's important. Uh, sure. Well, I have a, I have no problem giving out a personal email because they still have spam and junk and filters, so the haters will hate. Uh, <laughs> here's the deal. It's uh, lowercase pd, wow, who knew, police department, uh, my initials, mck, the number five at gmail.com. Well, that's generous of you. You bet. I hope that, uh, you know, some people do reach out to understand more. Well, I just want to say that uh, I, working with Chad and looking at the litany of guests that you have hosted, uh, this is a sleeping giant of sorts and one that I told him that I am going to be using as click opportunities as I'm just uh, relaxing at night having a beer around the fire pit because you have some who's who's of some great offerings that are both inspirational and aspirational for even old people like me and it's a nice way to do a check-in to remember where you came from and but where you ultimately what the trajectory of your life's path wants to be and how you're going to be impactful on others and i i love the bevy of guests and topics that you have called to date and so I'm extremely humbled that I would even be asked to sit in the same seats as so many of those. Well, no, I mean, it's, I appreciate the kind words because for me, it's more like 
No, why the heck wouldn't I have you on? You know, oh, that's especially very Especially at a time, the time like this when we got so much, uh, you know, just unrest, mm -hmm. I think is the best word I can use. Um, uh, people are scared. People are, uh, are uh, uncertain. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, of uh, many different things, but especially of the police right now. Chad, you know, having served and been activated with, uh, with the Air National Guard, I mean, not just him, but people have told me that people are less scared of the military than they are of police right now. Being oh. on the streets, which is just definitely mind-boggling to me. Definitely. But but it's an accurate statement, and it's also coming from people that don't look like you or me. Mm -hmm. So um, I just uh, you know thank you so much for a <clears throat> excuse me your service for so many years for our community um, and our nation when you're with the FBI. But uh, uh, and as Bucky, yeah. I was back in the day, but because uh, uh, Bucky's keeping the kids smiling, it keeps my kids smiling all the time. So oh, I'm glad. I mean that's the thing. I, I said to my I said to Jane at one point after a rough day at the office as chief, I said, what a dichotomy in my life to go from the most <laughs> revered Beloved. symbol of Wisconsin to the most vilified in the city of Madison at times. Oh, my gosh. What a roller coaster. Well, we'll have to do this again because there's probably, I mean, we gave a broad context of sure. everything. But, I mean, I think there's some topics we could dig deep on and that people would be interested in. And like you said, like the leaders that we've had on here, like Chad and I created this to give back. Um, just to have leader to leader conversations. And Absolutely. so it's uh, hopefully we can continue to do that and bring on great guests like yourself and, and continue to have these conversations so people can learn. I'm in a growth mode every day, and that's part of the reason I do this as well. I get to learn while I sit here and interview people. Well, it's so. great. It's, it's, it's what we talked about earlier. It's like this is a, a, another part of the branch of public service announcements and enlightenment so that people, you know, knowledge is power. And the more you understand about another person's perspective and the dimensions, I think that's infinitely emancipating for many people because they have an epiphany. Aha, I didn't yeah. think about it like that. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, you bet. Well, thank you. And everybody, tune in next week and can't wait to get this out to you. Continue to inspire and impact.